So how are we all today? What was, what was that? Awesome, excellent, excellent. I was actually at a conference like uh, a few weeks ago, the World Domination Summit, and um, I, I don't know if anyone else was there or not, but I had this role as volunteer to high five every person as they came through the door. And I high-fived like 2,000 people in one day and got the coolest injuries imaginable. <laughs> so, so like I was, I was pretty excited then, I'm pretty excited now. I want to say a huge thank you to Ed for being a fantastic conference chair. So Ed is off stage, but thank you very much, Ed. <laughs> and um, so today I'm talking about not necessarily excitement, but you'll see a lot of excitement with me, um, but fear, uncertainty, and dopamine. And so I have this whole thing where I'm fascinated with people's brains. I've, the last couple of years, been absolutely fascinated how do brains work, how do people think, what's going on inside their head, and what the hell is that? <laughs> okay, there is a volume control inside I did not expect, and as you might have seen then, I still need to reboot my computer to apply those updates, <laughs> as I've had to do for the last six weeks. So. <laughs> What I love to do is look at people and how they think and see if there's any way that we can maybe encourage them <laughs> to become better open source citizens. So the title of the talk is Fear, Uncertainty, and Dopamine, and I want to start with fear. So fear is great because it's this wonderful motivating force. You can really motivate people using fear. And, and in fact, it's worth um, sort of paying attention to the two types of motivation that you can get. Um, one type of motivation that you'll find is internal motivation. And internal motivation is things like, um, this is what I enjoy, this is what I like, or the most important, this is the sort of person that I am. That is a very, very strong internal motivation. If somebody says, I am the sort of person who writes good software, that will motivate them to act in a particular way. The other sort of motivation that you'll find is external motivation. And the one we most commonly encounter there is money, but it doesn't have to be money. Um, I do my taxes every year, not because I love doing my taxes or I identify someone who like, does their taxes every year. I do it because I'll get in trouble if I don't do them. So there can be fines and penalties. That's an external motivation. And there is this fascinating sort of area in the middle with status. So as humans, status is like this really, really important thing. We like to feel we belong somewhere and how we fit in. And, and you see a lot of things, particularly in open source, where people are working for the status because it makes them feel like they're good people. People give them recognition. And status is sort of this weird bridge between the two because status is very often, here is how I feel inside, how I see myself, but there's other people externally validating that as well. Now, I'm going to argue throughout this, court, this talk that uh, internal motivations are generally better than external motivations. And one of the reasons is that external has upkeep. You have to keep on giving people money, or you have to keep on um, threatening them with fines or something. So, so let's start with um, some experiments, uh, not ones conducted by me, but conducted with, by psychologists. And, and I love how psychologists get around this thing on ethics, and they can do things like experimenting on children. So, so this is an experiment which involved threatening four-year-olds. <laughs> and, and it started off, it seemed very nice, it started off by saying, we're going to give you some toys. And you give them like a whole range of toys, and you know, maybe there's some Lego in there, um, or maybe there's some robots to play with. These are from the Zombie Shuffle in Melbourne. The Zombie Shuffle in Melbourne is awesome. Um, and what you get them to do is you get them to rank the toys. So how do you get children to rank toys? You say, out of this toy or this toy, which one do you like more? And out of this toy and this toy, which one do you like more? And usually the kids come up with like a consistent ranking. If they don't, then you throw them out of the study. Because <laughs> they, they have these circular things. And then what you do is you forbid their second favorite toy. You figure out which one is their second favorite, and you forbid it. Now, the reason we're choosing the second favorite is we're going to ask the kid later on what their preferences are. This allows it to go up in preference and down in preference. So we forbid that toy, but then you have two conditions. In one group, you say, I'm going to leave the room for 10 minutes, and if you play with this toy, I will be somewhat annoyed. And in the other group, this is the weak threat. In the other, threat, you, other group, you have the strong threat. I'm going to leave the room for 10 minutes, and if you play with this toy, I will be angry, and I'll take away all the toys, and I will never come back, and the most traumatic thing you can say to a four-year-old, I will think that you're a baby. 
So these kids really don't want that to happen. And the, you leave for 10 minutes, and sure enough, the kids are there, and they look at the toy, and they want to play with the toy, and they go, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. You know, none of them actually play with the toy. And what you find when you come back, and you say, you can play with all the toys, you let them play, you ask them their rankings again, you find that in the strong threat, where I was going to say that you're a baby if you play with this toy, that toy, the forbidden toy, becomes more attractive. It's something which has been denied to them. The reason that's been denied has now been taken away. It becomes more attractive. This toy must be special somehow. It usually goes to first place. But what's fascinating is the weak threat. In the case of the weak threat, the toy becomes less attractive. And we think this is because of what's going on inside the kid's mind. It's like, well, you know, there's this researcher, I don't really know them, my parents say that they're okay, and, you know, if I disappoint them, that's not going to be too bad, but I'm still not playing with this toy. What's going on? And they have these conflicting beliefs in their mind. I'm not playing with this toy, but I don't have a good reason for it. My actions and my thoughts are, are not in sync. And we call this cognitive dissonance. And in almost all cases where people experience cognitive dissonance, what they've done and what they're thinking are different, they change their thoughts to be in line with what they are doing or what they have done. And so you end up with things like this, I wouldn't have enjoyed it anyway. Whenever you see somebody say, I wouldn't have enjoyed it anyway, it's probably something which they thought they would have enjoyed, they weren't able to participate in it, and now they've changed their thoughts to say, actually, that wouldn't have been much fun. And the same thing happens with the kids. They're like, oh, well, I don't like that toy because it's smelly, or because babies would play with that toy, or because of, you know, whatever other reasons. They come up with their own excuses why. Now, this is a very, very powerful technique if you want to change people's behavior. And we're going to look at a real-world example, and we're actually going to go back to the Korean War, and I'll link this into open source in a moment. So, the Korean War, there were Chinese communist prisoner of war camps. And they were really, really unique as far as prisoner of war camps go because they held essay writing competitions. <laughs> so you would come into this camp and they're like, hi, please sit down. Um, we would like you to write an essay. And the essays involved things like, you know, say why America's not perfect. Um, or let's talk about why maybe communism isn't quite as bad as it's made out to be. They wouldn't be like, you have to change your opinion to be something very strong. They'd be very, very gentle things. And there would be rewards for essay writing competitions. If you won them, then you'd get like a piece of fruit or a couple of cigarettes. But they weren't very strong rewards. And of course, if you won an essay competition, you would read that out in front of all of your peers. And what this was was this amazing, incredibly effective campaign to change the opinions of the prisoners to say, actually, you know what? Maybe communism isn't that bad. Maybe we shouldn't be fighting this war. And it was incredibly effective at changing opinions, especially because they would see their peers doing this as well. Now, do we do this in open source? Absolutely we do. And in fact, you see it in the Pearl Foundation. So the Pearl Foundation gives out grants every year on ways that you can improve Pearl. And of course, they have an essay writing competition that you have to write, and people have to evaluate you know, how much grant they're applying for, and the people who do this are incredibly like, skilled and wonderful, and they always sell themselves for way less than they're worth. That's the piece of fruit or the couple of cigarettes. And what happens is now this person is strongly believing that they're doing this, and, but the reward isn't big enough. They now have their honor on the line. They now have their status on the line. They're no longer a volunteer. They've taken themselves, they've binded themselves to the project, and this is effectively a commitment device. Now, that absolutely involves fear, but it's not necessarily a fear of punishment, it's a fear of inconsistency with self-image. If I've got myself a grant to do something, and then I fail that grant, well, everyone's going to call me a baby. So I don't want that. So that's great for binding existing contributors. Is there a way that we can use cognitive dissonance to bring in fresh blood? And you can. So another one back in the 1960s, um, and all of these citations here, there's a link at the end where you can get them all, um, it involved saying, can we put this sign in your yard? You'd have people turn up at people's doorsteps and say, hey, we want to put this sign in your yard. And they'd show them a picture. And the picture had this enormous sign. You could maybe see a little bit of a house in the background. And, um, and they'd say, we want to put the sign in the yard. And yeah, we might have to dig up your lawn a little bit and pour in some concrete. But normally, the grass grows back and everything. And the sign says, drive safely. Now, it wasn't a very attractive sign. 
Um, if you thought that Comic Sans is not a very attractive font, you should see the Comic Sans of the 1960s. <laughs> and like the kerning was a little bit off. This is not something which you'd normally want in your yard. Even so, 16.7% of people would agree to having this sign. So that is like the baseline rate of either utter insanity or very community-minded individuals in the United States. But you could change this. And the way in which you changed it was fascinating. What you'd do is you'd turn up two weeks earlier, completely different person, and say, hi, um, we're doing a Drive Safely campaign. Uh, we're handing out these stickers, which you can put on your bumper bar. They're completely free. Can I give you one? And of course, everyone accepts the sticker. Everyone puts them on the bumper bars. There's no second thoughts about doing this. And the sticker says, be a safe driver. But what that does is it changes people's internal perceptions of themselves. Now they are someone who believes in safe driving. They've put this on their car. And two weeks later, when you come back, completely different person that they've never seen before from a completely different organization, and you ask to put this ridiculous sign in the yard, three quarters of people say yes. <laughs> By applying a sticker, a sticker <laughs> to your bumper. I wonder what's going on there. Whoa. <laughs> and in fact, you don't even have to say anything about driving. So this was conducted in California. You give people Keep California Beautiful stickers. That doesn't even mean anything. <laughs> and still, the compliance rate goes up to about 50%. So what's going on there? You are changing people's self-image. You are changing people to think of themselves as a community-minded citizen. Um, do grab me after this talk and ask about how you can use this in soliciting donations. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's called the foot in the door technique. You get this tiny little foot in the door, accept a sticker or do a tiny thing, and suddenly people change their opinions of themselves. And this is the reason why entry-level tasks in open source are so important because they give you the ways that people can change their own self-image. If they file a bug, if they fix a wiki page, you know, you intentionally put spelling mistakes on wiki pages, right? So people can come in and fix them. You know, give a lightning talk, wear a badge or a sticker or tweet about your project or write an essay, all of those things will change someone's self-image. And if you see people doing that, please acknowledge them like crazy, because suddenly, not only do they have this self-image change, they feel included in the project. They feel like they're being valued by the project, and it makes them feel good, but it also binds their fate to yours. <laughs> if your project fails, that now reflects badly on them because they're involved in your project. So let's move on to uncertainty. And let me just take a small sip of water, so do excuse me for a moment. There's a wonderful talk that uh, Noreen, some of you may know Noreen, she's currently off like hiking in some awesome mountains, um, called Text Communication Lacks Empathy. And in fact, you'll see this all the time, um, particularly on mailing lists. So you'll see somebody say on a mailing list, you know, what color should we paint this bike shed? And somebody will just post blue. And then you'll get the response of like, I don't know why you always have to be in my face about this thing, and like, why are you always so hostile, and what's going on, and blah, 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 blah. There was no hostile intent to begin there. The message didn't carry any hostile intent, but somebody blows up. And you see this all the time. And I want to know why on earth is this happening? And you can understand it pretty simply if you think about how we evolved. And um, evolutionary psych is a fascinating area because there's all these politics in it, but this is one thing that's pretty much agreed upon. The biggest threat to your ancestors when humans were evolving were not mountain lions, it was not falling rocks, it was not you know, um, gamma rays or anything like that, it was other humans. So it was vitally, vitally important that you were able to spot hostility in other humans. That was essential for your survival. If you missed somebody being hostile, you could end up dead, you could end up being ostracized, you could end up you know, without your resources or reproductive opportunities or whatever it happens to be. So you need to make sure you can spot hostility or that your ancestors could spot hostility. If you miss somebody being nice to you, you're just being a jerk. <laughs> That's nowhere near as bad. 
And so we have this natural hostility bias. We will naturally see hostility when it's not there. And in fact, hostile intent is very easily decoded. When that person comes back and says, why do you keep on going on about blue? Why, no, why can't you leave us alone? It's very clear that person's being hostile. It's very easy to spot that. But um, positive intent, mutual intent, is very often poorly decoded. And in fact, I see situations where positive intent is misinterpreted all the way as negative. Someone's like, why are you being sarcastic? And it's like, no, actually, I thought your code was good. I was giving you a compliment. And this happens not just in text communication. It happens with meet space cues. It doesn't happen just with strangers. It happens in married couples as well. Lots of research on married couples. Absolutely systemic. So just imagine how much worse text is when you have strangers and relationships you don't have. And this will snowball. Person one will say something neutral. Person two will say, have a hostile response to that. Now there's genuine hostility. It'll just evolve from there. And it gets worse if you have a poor relationship with someone. If you've previously had a problem with this person in the past, now suddenly everything is tilted towards that hostile lens. Now, the best advice I have for this is to assume good intent. If you see something and you're not sure if that's hostile or not, then you know, if you can, assume that it's neutral or assume it's good. And if you're really not sure, ask them. I've had times where I'm like, look, I'm not really sure. This doesn't feel very friendly, what you're saying. And the person will go, oh, I'm really sorry. I can see exactly how it would have come across that way. Absolutely, that's not what I intended. I've also had times going, no, I'm actually being a jerk here. But you know, <laughs> that's YouTube. So, what I want to bring on to here is, um, is outreach. And one thing that we, we know a lot with humans um, is that we like familiarity. And this is not necessarily a conscious bias. This is a very unconscious one. And you see this in advertising all the time. So you can go and look at advertisements. This is an advertisement for painkillers. You can tell who that's going to be advertised at. It's aiming at women. And here is something which is aimed at seniors. And here's something aimed at like teenage girls and men and so on and so forth. Um, if you're Microsoft, Microsoft is aiming at business people and a very diverse demographic of business people, unless you happen to be in Poland, in which case they become less diverse. <laughs> but advertisers understand this very, very well. People like familiarity. And there is a wonderful blog article, which you can find online by Greta Christina, which talks about homogeneity inertia. Put very simply, if you have a group of people which all share some common and usually obvious demographic, then what will happen is that will continue on. Even if that group wants to include other people, even if there's nothing stopping other people from joining, that group will continue with this homogenous way. And uh, what that comes down to is relating to people like us. If I see lots of people like me that I identify with, it's like, oh, I, I feel at home here. If I'm in a group, and I'm trying to figure out what should we focus on, I'm going to be focusing on the things which affect me, which will probably affect the people who are like me. I'm not necessarily going to focus on the things which are people who are not like me, because I'm not even going to think of that. And that's not any sort of hostility or bad intention, it's just you don't think of that. And what ends up happening is this ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I turn up to a group or somebody turns up to a group, and it's like, wow, everyone here is totally different to me, maybe this is not the group that I should be in. And it's not because that group is being hostile, it's just like, maybe there's a reason why everyone here is different to me, maybe this is not where I belong. This is why outreach is important. And in fact, this struck me um, a few years ago at a, a Pearl conference. Um, Jacinta Richardson, who co-founded Pearl Training Australia, uh, was at Yapsi, and she asked people about operating systems. What operating systems did people use? What operating systems did people support? And the people in the room, the Pearl community, about 10% of people were supporting or coding on Windows. And in fact, when she asked, you know, who here is using Windows, there was this murmur that went through the room where people were like, oh, Windows, sort of thing. If you were a Windows developer there, it did not feel like a very friendly environment. And sure enough, the, the Windows CPAN, uh, the comprehensive Pell archive network for the Windows, is, is impoverished. But if you ask people involved in training, and there were lots of people involved in training there, how much their students used Windows, people who could actually afford money or get sponsorship to come to a course and learn Perl, 50% of them did. And those people don't necessarily enter the Perl community because it doesn't feel like a nice place. So this is why outreach is important. 
because you give people a way of coming in. This is why role models are important. This is why I'm so happy to see blatant plug here, things like the GNOME Outreach Program for Women, which has been absolutely awesome and actually is giving uh, women money to enter open source. It's making it a more welcoming place. It's giving them role models. It's absolutely fighting this homogeneity inertia. So the last part of my talk, um, dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Um, it's most commonly associated with pleasure, although it does a whole bunch of other interesting things. And um, I have this fascination of, will this thing make me happy? Because I would like to be happy. That ends up being a really hard question to answer, really hard. A much easier question to answer is, will I regret this later on? <laughs> and there have been lots of studies done on regret. Now, it's fascinating because um, people go, oh, you regret the things which you don't do. And what we actually find is that in the short term, we regret the things which we do do. But we are going to look at long term here. Um, this was a study of 720 gifted individuals. And of course, I immediately start to include myself in this group. I go, this is obviously a study which is related to me. Um, and they've been tracked for years, and they're now in their 70s. So these are the things which smart people regret when they, when they reach their 70s. And what you find is there's an amazing balance between things they've done and things they haven't done. So 27% of people regretted seizing the moment for some sort of opportunity, but 22% regretted rushing in too soon. There's a lot of balance here. 16% regretted a missed romantic opportunity. 12% regretted an unwise romantic adventure. Again, a lot of balance here. So if you're encountering, should I rush into this? Should I do this? You know, it really is a coin flip. Well, it's not a coin flip. Education. If you are smart, missing educational opportunities, pretty good chance of regretting that. Actually going for education, Practically nobody did. Education seems to be something which is not a regrettable action. Of course, these were also very smart Alec people in the uh, study. So half a percent of them part uh, regretted participating in the study in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that this was written up as one of the criteria. They actually had like open answered questions, and half a, half a percent said, I regret being in the study. It sucked. But the most telling part is hobbies. 14% of people had a serious regret that they did not pursue a hobby that they otherwise thought they would have enjoyed. Number of people who regretted wasting time on a hobby, nobody. 720 participants, not one of them said, gosh, I wish I didn't spend so much time hacking my open source code or so much time modding Dwarf Fortress or whatever it happened to be. Nobody regretted their hobbies. And in fact, there were 548 separate unique regrets to analyze. Nobody regretted their hobbies. So if you are thinking of what should I do now, where is the next place that I'm going to be going in life, um, if you're thinking of doing something new, if you're thinking of joining a project, trying out an idea, launching a project, learning a skill, doing any of those things, then please, please, please tweet publicly about it. Maybe put a sticker on your laptop, maybe write an essay and publish that online, and then go for it. Because I almost guarantee that you won't regret it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>